when Moses was leading the Israelites through the wilderness, he spoke to God himself. And when God told Moses to lead them to the promised land, Moses begged God not to order them to move if his presence would not go with them. God promised that he would go with them, and Moses asked to see God's glory. However, God said that Moses could only see his glory from the backside, for no one could see God's face and live. Today's song has a little different take on this, though. Hi, I'm Eric Rock, and this is Worship Song Lyric Analysis. For those of you who are new to this series, thanks for joining us. I'm so glad that you found these videos, and I pray that they would be encouraging and edifying and help you think about the lyrics that you sing to God. In this series, we try and figure out, A, if there's any confusion at all, what do the words in the song actually mean? I mean, sometimes worship songs get a little carried away with their metaphor. And, more importantly, B, are those songs biblical? Today, we're analyzing a newer song, When I Lock Eyes With You, by Maverick City Music and Upper Room. When I Lock Eyes With You was written by Alyssa Smith, Brandon Lake, Jonathan Jay, and Tony Wood. It was actually recorded live in Upper Room Dallas in the summer of 2020. I was looking around and I couldn't find any official behind the music story or passage this was based on other than this oddly press release style statement from Upper Room. Jesus is our passion, desire, and pursuit. We love to love him as he has loved us. Our community centers itself first and foremost around this activity, receiving love from God and giving love back to God through prayer and worship. And this is a great sentiment. Jesus should be our desire and our passion. But we need to worship Christ in the way that he wants to be worshipped. So how does the song match up with the word itself? Let's jump right on in. All right, the song starts off in verse 1. When I lock eyes with you, I see my reflection. Okay, so full disclosure, when I first read this line, I thought that they were saying that when they looked at the face of God, they saw someone who was a lot like them, which is obviously really bad and disqualifies this song right away if that were the case. God is so much greater than we are. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He is not like us. And frankly, it kind of worries me that that could be a reading of it. But after more study, I am more inclined to think that the actual meaning they meant was they are getting so close to God's face that they see their own reflection in God's eyes, i.e. closeness and intimacy with God. And while closeness and intimacy with God is something we can and should have as believers, this line is still a huge issue. If we're that close in God's presence and all we think of is ourselves, something is wrong. When Isaiah saw the presence of God, he says, woe to me for I am a sinful man. His official statement was, I am a man of unclean lips, probably signifying some sin he did with his lips. When people in the Bible saw God's presence, they were overwhelmed with his greatness. They didn't think about, oh, look, I'm so close to God's face, I can see myself. They didn't think about themselves, they thought about God. And if this worship song is glorifying ourselves in this way instead of God, that's an issue. It continues, when I lock eyes with you, I feel your affection. And that one I can get behind, kind of, because affection is love, and per 1 John, God is love, so if we get close to God, we should be overwhelmed by his love as well. However, again, the first thing we should be overwhelmed by is his holiness. Yes, God is love, but he is also holy and righteous. If we focus too much on the love part, then the holiness can get lost. Also, it may seem small, but an important distinction should be made because the word affection, while it does mean love in English, kind of has the connotation of love in the eros sexual or storge familial sense rather than the unchanging, life-giving, agape love of God. 
Affection is a feeling. Love is a verb. And those who don't know the scriptures very well might not know this and be led astray by this kind of songwriting. So we need to be super careful about stressing what kind of love God has for us. It's not simply feely feely affection. It is love that calls us to action. I love to get lost in you because you're my obsession. God should be our obsession. However, in Psalm 119, it actually clarifies this when David says, how I love your law, I meditate on it day and night. So yes, God should be our obsession, but that obsession should manifest itself in loving the word of God, the law. We shouldn't just be obsessed with looking at God's face like he's our cosmic boyfriend. We need to be obsessed with reading God's word. When I lock eyes with you. I just wanted to tie this back into that story in Exodus 33. When Moses asks to see God's glory and God says that basically he will put Moses in the cleft of a rock, cover it and pass by and Moses will see the backside of his glory because no one can see God's face and live. And yeah, I understand that when we get to heaven, we will see God face to face and know as we are known. But right now, we as sinful people cannot see God's holy face and live. The song continues, all I want is you, all I need is you, all I see is you, just you. And it repeats a lot. In this analysis, I'm literally just gonna try and do the first time all of these stanzas occur and then say, and it repeats a lot afterwards to so get the gist. All we want should be God. You know, Psalm 73, 25, whom have I in heaven but you and the earth has nothing I desire besides you talking to God. So all we want, all we need is God. That is a good sentiment to have in a worship. The song continues, coming like a fire, coming like a flood, I don't care what it looks like, I'm so in love. Okay, I'm just gonna come out and say it, I don't think this is biblical at all. The song says, I don't care what it looks like. That is false. We as Christians are called to test the spirits. Just because it makes you feel love does not automatically mean that it's from God. If it makes you feel love, but it says that Jesus is not the Messiah, that is not from God. And if you say, I don't care what it looks like, that's setting yourself up for failure. We need to care what it looks like. Satan himself can disguise himself as an angel of light. He can come looking like something that looks a lot like love from God. And if we don't have discernment as believers, how will we know the difference? If we're not in God's word, looking intently at exactly who God is and how he works and how he can work through us, how will we know? If we're saying, I don't care what it looks like, that's not good. That's not good theology. We need to care what it looks like. And to be fair, yes, God's love in our lives can manifest itself in different ways. It could be serving at church, leading a life group, giving to the poor, being a missionary, it can manifest itself in different ways. So if you're a Christian who's so in tune with God and his word that you feel like you can sing that and only think about it in the correct way of, I don't care what it looks like as long as it's biblical, I aspire to be that in tune with God that I can sing songs and only think about them in the correct biblical way. But for the 99.9% .9 of us that aren't, this is not a good way to think about it. We should care what it looks like. God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you're not going to keep my commandments, are you loving God in the right way? But I don't care what it looks like. But God told you to care what it looks like. If you're not loving God the way he wants to be loved, are you truly loving God or are you just loving yourself? So yeah, 
Spoilers for the end, I don't think this section is biblical. I think the fatal flaw of not testing what the love looks like hurts the worship experience here. But the song goes on. One more section. It's long and fairly repetitive. Search me, oh God. Search my heart. And if you find any desire that's not you, that's not you, take it all away. Take it all away till all that's left is you. Send a searchlight down from heaven. Search me, search me, I'm open. Search me, search me, search me, search me. You're the only one who's qualified. You're the only one who's qualified because you made me, you made me, because you made me, you made me. You know what's supposed to be there. You know what's supposed to be there. And this part is actually fairly biblical. It's from Psalm 139, 23 and 24, where it is asking God to search my heart and to know if there's any anxious thoughts and to come in and fix that. So I would say that this section is actually fairly biblical for what it's worth. Okay, that was When I Lock Eyes on You by Maverick City Music and Upper Room. Is it biblical? Unfortunately, even with the most generous interpretation of the lyrics, I cannot give this one a recommend for worship, even personally or with a church. Well, I guess if you went like line by line to your church to explain this is how you should think about this line biblically, this is how you should think about this line biblically, but even then people wouldn't get it and there's so many better worship songs. Now I want to say this, I do not think that anyone who wrote this song or recorded this song or performs this song are bad people, are heretics, are satanic or anything like that because I know that sometimes those get thrown around in analyzing worship songs and I truly believe that they are trying to worship God. They just lack knowledge of how to properly worship God, which is a sad thing and something that we need to correct. But we need to lovingly correct people who do this, not call them heretics and expel them from our fellowship. No, we need to lovingly say, hey, this is how God has told us to worship him. Let's worship him like that together. Because Soapbox Time, it's a pet peeve of mine when people analyze worship songs and just hate on the writers the whole time. Like, they are fallen people too. And I'm not gonna say every time, but a lot of the time, they are truly trying to worship God. They just don't know enough scripture to write songs that fully match up to scripture. Which, again, is a sad thing, but something we should lovingly correct and lead them to the truth. Not toss them to the side and pronounce them anathema. So believer, if you know and love God's word, today I encourage you to encourage someone else who might love God but lack a little knowledge of his word to know God's word more, to fall more in love with God by loving the law. Okay, off the soapbox. All right, if you guys have made it this far in the video, thank you so much. I really hope that it helped and encouraged you and made you think more about songs in a biblical way. I appreciate you. And if you've been following the series as a whole, I wanted to say that I've done a lot of negative reviews recently, just because I want people to be aware of songs that they probably shouldn't be worshiping to, but I'd like to get some reviews of positive songs out. So hopefully in a little bit, I'll have some songs out that are really good to worship to, that have a solid biblical message. And until next time, friends, I pray that God's holiness and righteousness would give you that solid foundation in the crazy world that we live in, and that every day God would fill you with his peace.